The first chapter of my life was in a professional boys' choir. That's how I learned a lot about music, and that's what I did until my voice changed, really. But I had a tape recorder from a very young age, which I made from the choir, because we, we were professional. <laughs> and um, I would record everybody's records, and I was into soul music a lot. Beatles came along when I was 13, courtesy of my sisters, I think, more than anything else. I enjoyed it. I also liked the Kinks, who were sort of a local band. And I switched over, as you might think. To, and I was playing jazz, too, uh, with two guys from school. In London, when I was a teenager, the, obviously the Marquee Club was the famous Marquee. It was cheap. They didn't have a bar, so I could go in as a 16-year-old, 15, 16-year-old. So all the great bands there, The Who, The Yardbirds. Um, I saw Yes one night when there were 11 people in the audience. If you can believe it, they had Thursday night residency. And one cold, rainy night, I went down along with 10 other people. <laughs> and they were mind-blowing in the early days. I mean, I listened to everything. And I played guitar in uh, the high school band until the bass player started writing songs and he wanted to play guitar on his own songs. And that was what got us noticed by this very, very small record company. <laughs> we're, we're there, there's a five CD retrospective that we've been working on all year, released in February. Well, Byzantium is the band that it's the retrospective of. Um, but in fact, I was Byzantium's producer and sometimes engineer. But the first of the five CDs is the high school band, which has some of the same members, some of the same songs and demos and, you know, like they do with box sets. So. The tiny record company that, that um, put out the high school band record, he decided to build a studio and he knew nothing about it. He basically just, he had a bingo hall <laughs> and he instructed his two workmen to cut off a corner of the bingo hall and make a studio. That was about all the instructions they had. So, um, but he did know to buy pretty good equipment. And I was you know, not his protege, but I, he'd used me for odd things, you know, running masters around London and playing piano actually on a couple of records that he made. And that was fun. Um, so I was able to hang around in the studio and I had about a week where I went in every night with a friend and I figured everything out. And the next week, <laughs> the next week the engineer didn't turn up for a, quite a big session. The orchestral instruments and you know people being paid money that the session had to happen. So I just said I think I can handle it. So I did. and. There you are, I was an engineer from that day on. <laughs> Slept under the piano quite often. <laughs> you know, it was a one-man operation pretty much, and at the end of the session I had to clean up beer and cigarettes mostly. And um, I was just too tired to go home, and I knew I had to be back in just a few hours anyway. <laughs> Quite a time. I mean, I think back now, I've never worked as hard as I did then. And I, you know, I was 19 when I started doing that. A lot of my clients took me to other studios around London, so I became pretty well known in the studio scene. <laughs> but my favorite client was Rory Gallagher. He was such a nice guy and a really great player. And he wasn't very demanding. He wanted to do live vocals and live lead guitar and then see if there was anything else. And um, he got me out of the studio. He took me on several tours that we recorded. Um, Irish Tour 74 is probably his best known album. And I was there in Cork, <laughs> trying to stay sober. <laughs> I feel like I didn't see any summers for about six years. And it was nice to get out of the studio. My friends in the band Caravan lived in Canterbury, which is a beautiful part of the country. 
And that one day I just left the studio and got straight on a train to Canterbury. Ah, great. But then the bass playing came back into my life. You see, that was really um, a big change. And then I got recommended to this singer, Dana Gillespie, who had um, main man management, which was David Bowie's management. And she said she wanted to get a live band together. And I, would I be the bass player? And would I do the arrangements? Well, it was just writing out chords, really. All of a sudden, she, she took us to New York. And there we were, having a fabulous time on David Bowie's coattails, spending a lot of money. His manager, Tony DeFries, um, had a concept where he'd spend as much of the record company money as possible because then they'd take notice of the album and promote it and so on and so forth, which worked for David. Didn't really work for our band, but we had still had a great, great time living it up in New York for a couple of weeks in Philadelphia, spending David's money or RCA's money. At the end of that, I stayed in New York City until my money ran out. And I met this band who some friends took me over there and they were rehearsing as a three-piece without a bass player. And they, I thought I really liked their songs and their attitude. So I sat in as, you know, unknown British bass players would do. And it sounded like a real band. So I went home and a few months later they said, you know, soon to tour, soon to record, we want you. And that was amazing. I pretty much packed up and left England as soon as I could, moved to New York. And indeed, they'd signed with Arista Records with Clive Davis. They had big time management, lawyers, accountants, the whole deal, agents, William Morris. And we toured around and moved to LA after about six months, 76 through 78. And that was one of the best experiences of my life because we, we lived together, we wrote songs, we made demos in the house, which I engineered, of course. It just felt really good playing with those people. It was, you know, it was, unfortunately, the timing was wrong. They were um, really good, you know, we did four part harmonies, nice, fairly short songs good grooves and, and a little bit of comedy even thrown in. In fact, we did a pre precursor to Saturday Night Live. It was Saturday Night with Howard Cosell. And um, the management was big time. They mostly did comedians, unfortunately. And that's why we moved to LA, because they had a couple of comedians who were starting to do very well, named Robin Williams, uh, David Letterman, and Billy Crystal. So, couldn't compete with that. So we moved to LA and it was it was so exciting. You know, we, they had a, an office on the Paramount lot and we got the VIP tour and, you know, people, uh, I don't know, saying, oh, you got a great future. You know, you, we'll, we'll figure out a show for you guys. You know, <laughs> we did all the TV shows, Midnight Special, um, tonight Show, Merv Griffin. <laughs> um, so I got a real taste of the industry with that band. But um, as successful as their comedians were, they didn't really know what to do with us. So we fell apart. New York, Arista were really good. Uh, we got to LA and people were going, well, who are you guys? We don't know about you. So, And when the band split up, I had to play disco. You know, I had not, no money, no car. So I took top 40 work, which as I mentioned, was, was mostly disco in those days. And um, Rory Gallagher came to my rescue again. He was working with a producer up here called Elliot Mazer. And um, he wasn't happy with the mixes. So he suggested that I come up and remix. Um, and we got as far as the mastering room and he decided to drop the whole project. But meanwhile, I had a good relationship with Elliot and I came up and engineered a couple of albums for him. 
and found an apartment. And that was it. Because I, I'd had enough of ballet for three years. <laughs> Lived in San Francisco for the next 20 years of my life. Well, my favorite time was when I was with that band, The Movies, in New York and LA, especially when we were in New York. It just felt exciting that just around the corner, something was going to happen and we were going to break. Um, and what happened actually was punk rock came along and nobody wanted to listen to us anymore. But that was a period of my life that I wish I could go back to and, you know, rejoin it as it was. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hi. Hello, welcome, Robin. Hi. Thank you. We welcome you to Shooting the Shit with Guberman and Gans. <laughs> this is our first episode, hopefully the first of many. And I think David and I are both honored to have Robin as the first guest. In fact, Robin, you were the first person we thought of, just both of oh. us. <laughs> Glad well, it thank you. It's great to be here. And well, you had the great, you great advantage of being somebody that we both worked with and love, and who we figured would probably say yes. So, um, <laughs> I got it right the first time. Yeah, I'm easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Aren't we all? Well, listen, man. Why don't we get started? I'm always curious as to uh, how do we end up like this. There never seems to be a real common thread. It seems to be different for everybody. But. Um, Obviously, you weren't born in the U.S., or maybe you were. Um, so why don't you start with yeah, in why don't you tell us, like, where, where are you from and, you know, what, what, what it was like growing up there? Ooh, that's a difficult question. Well, I was born in London in a place called Hampstead, which is um, the highest part of London and has a beautiful area called Hampstead Heath that's untouched by, by man or woman. It's um, it's, a, it's a great place to go and, and get a taste of the wild right in the middle of the city. I grew up in a, you know, a suburb, North London. Uh, went to some, a couple of very good schools along the way, um, which actually didn't really teach music at all. I, I found a teacher who did teach music in, on the staff and got sort of private tuition so I could take some exams. I don't know why I needed exams, but um, uh, my spare time was all taken up with this choir, the London Boy Singers, which had, um, which was, uh, had been founded by Benjamin Britten, who was a very uh, prestigious British composer. And uh, he used us for his new material and he took us to a festival that he held every year in Oldborough. Um, and um, we got really well trained. So by the time I was 12, I, I could sight read very well. What kind of music was it? Well, it was a cappella choral music. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, yes, and it was the choir had four sections. Uh, I was the leader of the second sopranos because I was good with holding a harmony. Uh, they liked me there. <laughs> um, how, how old were you at this point? Well, I think I joined about nine and I sang in it until my voice changed when I was 15. Yeah, that's pretty common. They actually trained us so that we could keep singing through the voice change, but that didn't really work for me. So yeah, when my time was up, I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. but then I was more Sorry, but by then I was more interested in what was going on in the London clubs that I was able to go to and uh, listen to a lot of jazz. And there was indeed a jazz trio within the school, one of the teachers and two students, uh, the Dave Lund Trio. It's actually there on Google. <laughs> um, 
and a lot of experience. We played parties and small shows and played for fun every week and small shows in the school as well. And, uh, well, what more can I say about that? Except he was very good. He took us down to a club called the Ad Lib and to see a Dudley Moore trio. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if everybody remembers that Dudley was an incredibly great keyboard player. Check it out, Scott. Mm -hmm. He Not was that. Oscar Peterson style, really, really good player. And we were all blown away. We all thought we were going to play jazz for the rest of our lives. However, I had also seen the Beatles and the Who and the Yardbirds and the Stones. So I was thinking, hmm, this looks like more fun than playing in a jazz trio. Hmm. So we formed uh, a rock group, three-piece rock group, you know, Cream, Jimi Hendrix. Hmm. And I was the guitar player. Because so, I had a fuzz, because I had a fuzz box. Uh, so how how did you go from listening to jazz to you know when what was the first time you heard rock and roll and got into that? Well, I was happy with my classical music until I heard the Beatles, and I think it was as as the short video that that just showed says. I think it was my sisters that were playing it, and I went, "Oh, who's that?" And I got into it, it was very easy. So my friends who liked to play um, included me because I could show them how to play these simple tunes. <laughs> how, many, how many people organized their lives around music because of the Beatles? I mean, it's gotta be just vast numbers of the musicians of our rough generation, yes. you know? I mean, think about it, so amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah, different amongst younger people, of course. I think younger people, learn about the Beatles and are, are, you know, are just surprised and shocked to, to find that it's, you know, in a way, the beginnings of what we know is rock and roll now. Yeah. And, and you know, are, are shocked to find out that, oh, wow, this influenced so many people. I mean, to tell you the truth, I was born, a you know, a little bit later. And um, I, you know, that was kind of my discovery. I was like, how could this be the beginnings of everything? This is so amazing that it seems like, you know, this is like the last thing, you know, that this built up to this. So You mean the Beatles? Yeah, the Beatles. When, when I heard it, I cut, you know, to me, it seemed like, you know, it, uh, by that time, it was probably the late 70s, early 80s. And I, I, I heard Let It Be for the first time. Yeah. And it, to me, it seemed like this is the epitome of rock and roll. That's you know? very interesting. Now, you think, I just suddenly realized there's sort of an interesting parallel between the Grateful Dead and the Beatles in that each of them gathered together a bunch of different kinds of music and punch, uh, focused it really tightly, and then it exploded into something entirely new that encompassed all of that stuff. I mean, the Beatles brought together a bunch of different kinds of music, woodshedded the fuck out of it in, in uh, Hamburg, right? And and happened to be just amazing songwriters, and and so they they really just kind of launched a whole new world. And, and don't forget, they had a new album about every six months, and that was the event to wait for. Go straight out and buy the new album, and they pushed music a little bit further every time. Now that brings up a question, Scott. Did people of your generation get together and sit down and listen to records like people Robbins and my age did? Yeah, uh, especially when we were, when I remember being in high school, you know, and records were definitely still the rage. Um, and even though cassettes were so popular, um, people really, you know, if you were a real, really into music, you collected records. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what we did. We, you know, we smoked weed and we listened to music, <laughs> listen to records. Because it seems like the way music is consumed is so very, very different today that just the very idea of like when the White Album remasters came out a couple years ago, I actually had a few listening parties. I invited friends over and we just sat and listened really carefully through the whole thing and just talked about it and stuff because it was such an important record to all of us. And I really enjoyed, I had like half a dozen of these sessions with different people. And it was so much fun to experience it through the ears of a friend, you know, and, and um, compare notes and stuff. How, yeah. how, deeply we engaged with that music and how much magic it still has today. Absolutely, yeah. 
and the art of the record being something is just it's incredible you listen to records robin or what kind of media do oh you yes listen? i've got a lot of records i listen mostly to records from choice actually likewise um you know i, I went through a phase where you know when cds came around by the way sergeant peppers was my first cd that i ever got oh and uh, i you know i kind of almost immediately was like who needs these big giant records and, and literally just gave them away, threw, threw them out, moved, you know, and just got rid of them. And and now I'm in the process of replacing everything I've ever owned and more. And it's just a blast. It's great. Now I have a better, better system too. So to hear all those records and pull them yeah. together, it's yes. awesome. Well, I, I, I'm very into finding the original masterings, the original issues, because there really is something special about them. The, the quality does decline over the years as they press more and more and more. I'm very fond of certain of my records that were original. David Bowie's Low. It's an incredible <laughs> first, first pressing. It's, yeah. it's so loud, it's so clear, it's, it's got it's weird one, stuff on the drums. R RCA was known for using really flimsy vinyl in those days. I remember having a John Denver record that you can almost fold in half. <laughs> That's funny. Well, there was a vinyl shortage. <laughs> oh really? Oh, that's interesting. Oh, yes. yes. Well, in the seventies, part of the energy crisis, right? Right. Yeah, oil crisis. Same thing that drove gasoline prices way up into the forty cents a gallon range. That's uh -huh. right. Hmm. Yeah, the that's oil right. used in making records. Yeah. Hmm. Unfortunately, <laughs> people used to joke, "Those poor little vinyls are dying off." Yeah. <laughs> in August. You have to breathe more. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's coming back, that's for sure. Yeah. You mentioned Tony DeFreeze, Robin, in your uh, 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 in the film. Um, yes. I, I didn't deal with him directly, but I remember interviewing John Mellencamp right when he was uh, freeing himself from uh, from that company and the guy that forced him to call himself Tony John Cougar. Cougar. Right. He, he didn't want to be John Cougar anymore. Oh. Because mm. that's the guy who had made him be Johnny Cougar. Right, yes. I remember that. Johnny Cougar. Was well, I bet it wasn't easy getting free. And, and that thing you said about uh, when your your the band moved to L.A. and the label didn't know anything about you there, I saw that happen during my journalism career. I saw that happen to so many artists where they'd pour their whole life into that first record. But yes. the sales department had something else to do, like a Madonna drop that week or something, and it just fucking disappeared. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't think Clive bothered going to L.A. very often. There was a number two, Ben, someone, anyway. He used to come and visit us, and he didn't have much power. But literally, we, we got there, and we called Arista, and they, they really didn't know who we were. We didn't, we didn't know we had a new record out that was attached to a movie. Yeah. And, um, you know, we fell apart. We kept going. We wrote a whole album's worth of new songs, played them to Clive at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And um, he rejected them, but he said, I'm going to make you do one more single. He picked a song, I think much at random, sent us in with a producer called Richie Podler, who produced Steppenwolf and Three Dog Night, Little Studio on Ventura Boulevard. And we made this last single, which absolutely went nowhere. Hmm. But by that, by that time, he decided to drop us and put the word out, literally. You know, he's a powerful man. He said, I'm, I'm dropping the movies, Luke, don't touch them. So he, why would he do that? Why would he drop know. you and blackball you? I don't know. We had interest from Mercury and other labels, but all of a sudden they weren't interested. So we knew what had happened. That's yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd imagine if there's an answer to that, that it would be, uh, you know, a public relations sort of thing where uh, yeah. you know, Clive doesn't, if you guys make it big, Clive doesn't want to look like the guy that dropped you. <laughs> wow. But who knows? I mean, that, that's the only thing. Well, I've heard of that stuff before happening to other people too, so. And, and me as well, yeah. Mm. And I've also heard of, um, you know, this is also, this has been a presumption of mine because I always do hear about 
how the sophomore album is so important to a group and sort of makes or breaks them. And I've always wondered and, and presumed if that's because the label just doesn't give a shit about you and, until they see what kind of success you have with the first album. And then if they if you do well, they'll push you to make an even better album, you know, get better producer, or put you in a better studio or whatever. I don't know. It depends on what yeah. area you're talking about. I mean, are they in, in the 70s and 80s, there were artist development and they made commitments to artists and they would let it, they would let them put out like three or four records. And, and you know what I mean? You remember Robin, all those great yeah. acts on Warner Brothers, you know, I mean, oh, well, Warner Brothers is, sorry, do it really, yeah. Um, I tell you, uh, the demos we made in our house were really incredible, they still are, and um. There might have been six or seven that were ready to record professionally and, and make an album. I don't think they were all fantastic, but they mostly were. And uh, so I don't know what the deal was. <laughs> so back, back then, what can you do? I mean, obviously, so much has changed just recently in terms of what people could do at home in terms of recording and getting yeah. stuff together. What were you able to do for a demo at home, as you're describing? Like, what kind of equipment were you using? Oh, nothing. We borrowed a two-track recorder from our managers. Um, I used elements of the PA that we had. Um, recorded mono to mono overdubs. So you were both a bass. I was, I was a professional engineer still at that time right. as well, playing bass. So. So you were both a working musician and a working recording engineer at the at the very. Well, I had to because we never made any money. So the first <laughs> thing I did in LA was, was uh, apply to a few little studios. Um, one of them accepted me. I didn't have a car. I'll never forget taking a bus from the Valley into Hollywood. And um, <laughs> it didn't go to. Hollywood. It went to downtown LA, so then I was really lost. <laughs> <laughs> how did you get to San Francisco. No, that was LA. No, I'm asking how you got to San Francisco. Ah, well, after working top forty for a while, I got a surprise call from Elliot Mazer, who had been doing this project with Rory Gallagher, and uh, Rory didn't like the mixes, and Rory had suggested bringing me up and I got there and before I left before I left that project I found an apartment was ready to move <laughs> I liked it so much you should mention in passing that Elliot died about uh, a week before last I think just a few I hadn't days. Heard that. Oh. yeah oh, I'm sorry to break it to you here on the air but yeah he oh. yeah well, um, he was a friend for a year or two then he, he turned rather strange well one thing he did was while i was first in san francisco he took me down to stanford laboratory where they were developing digital sound yeah these were the days when they had to book their half hour on the mainframe and work like hell to, for that half hour to try and get <laughs> I, went there, I went there with Elliot once to to were you there at the at, when they had that very first ever all computer concert outdoors in the middle of the thing no because I, I believe I went there with Elliot and I, I he was very involved yeah yeah I and I knew later I knew Andy Moore who was one of the really chief guys down there at, mm. at Karma mm -hmm. um that was an amazing scene down there the digital reverb was developed down there and yeah this, this concert was the first uh, performance in which everything was being played back by from a computer and a, as robin was saying not only did you have to book the time they had to clear every disk drive in the building to so they could do <laughs> the performance right we're talking about yeah. things the size of washing machines that hold 40 megabytes on spinning drums mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a little unclear about this because I don't know anything about it. So this is some sort of a place where they're producing electronic music, the beginnings of electronic music. CCRMA, or the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. A fellow named Lauren Rush was working on digital reverb experiments at the time that I was down there. And uh, I think the um, FM synthesis used by uh, uh, like sequential circuits and um, you know modern synthesizers I think that of course, also yeah Yamaha being the biggest one Yamaha DX7 yeah and, right and Andy Andy Moore went on to uh, work at um, 
uh, Lucasfilm on the Sound Droid project, and and they later started Sonic Solutions, which is um, hmm. digital audio workstation. And I'm still using a successor to that, but that you should find out about Karma because a lot of amazing stuff came out of that lab. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that sounds so interesting. I will check that out more. Really cool. So, Robin, when, when uh, what did you know about? uh the u.s what did you know about la san francisco california anything before you you came here i'm sure a little bit right well let me see um i had read american novels definitely obviously um steinbeck hemingway henry miller so i had a funny skewed idea from different periods of time um, there's a lot of information on Frank Zappa records, if you listen closely, yeah. about t teenage life in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I didn't know a whole lot about the history. I learned, I caught up on that because I, I read history quite a lot. Uh, I knew from my little bit of touring that there are places I liked very much. Boston, New Orleans, and San Francisco in particular. Um, and I thought I could work towards living in one of those places, preferably San Francisco, and that's how it ended up. Um, what did I know? <laughs> <laughs> I knew not to walk in Central Park in the night. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I probably did by the end, I was very comfortable. I, I walked all over Manhattan carrying my base. Yeah, looking at rats this big and yeah. <laughs> being yeah, amazed. I've, I've seen people carrying drum kits on the freaking subway around New York. You yeah, know what you got to oh. do right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, people will put wheels on every instrument you could imagine in New York City. It's amazing. It's well, the only my, way to do it. My band, the movies, while we were playing in New York clubs, we, he had a cocktail kit, you know, which is just a tom-tom with snares on the top and a kick pedal on the bottom. And we, we could fit everything into a taxi. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's always a piano there. And there's one, and this little amp that I played through. <laughs> Preferably a checker. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of this. I don't know how familiar yeah. I am. I've heard of them. Oh, checker cab. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That I'm familiar with. <laughs> they have more room, huh? Yes. We so, played a story has just come into my head. So since this is the appropriate occasion, um, we got hired to play the Democratic uh, Convention Ball in 1976 at the Statler Hilton. And we all piled into the group van, no, into a taxi. <laughs> And got down there, and just before we got there, I realized I had forgotten my dis. Can you believe it? Oh. So I had to get a taxi back to the loft, pick up my base, and go back to the Statler Hilton. And by that time, they weren't allowing any traffic within two blocks of the hotel. So I grabbed my base, I walk up to the, to the, the back entrance, the st stage entrance, whatever it was. And they they went no no can't come in and I said oh I'm playing in in one of the bands and they said oh okay so they ushered me no idea or anything ushered me through a little door and I was standing next to Hubert Humphrey <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> how times have changed I tell you wow <laughs> that's pretty amazing yeah. amazing anyway. I first uh, uh, met you when you were playing with Vince Wellnick in the uh, wow. Missing Man formation. Let's, let's talk about Vince a little bit. He his uh, birthday just passed, and everybody, we got a uh, we played um, Golden Days on our show the other day, and I got to cry about it all over again. What a sweet, crazy dude he was. Well put. Yeah, that describes exactly. It. Yes, <laughs> those two things. <clears throat> yes. Well, I was Missing Man too. Right. And. Um, Steve Kimmick and Bobby Vega and Prairie Prince had left part one and they were saying, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> but I would drive up from the city to Forest Hill where he had a nice place and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. Hmm. And finally, it was hard to find a guitar player. I mean, we were having, we were turning down, you know, Harvey Mandel and 
really good guitar players weren't good enough for Vince. Really? Yeah. Eventually, we got an all singing, all playing band together and went out and did a few cheesy gigs. They weren't very good gigs, um, except maybe that festival in New York that's, that's the, the vibes that's yeah. still happening in a different location. Dog. <laughs> I hear a dog. That's my but dog. He was trying to he make was, us parents. <laughs> he really was kind of crazy, poor guy, yeah. as we all know now. Yeah, sweet soul, but yeah, unfortunately. Oh, I, thought been, I thought you had been with him a little longer than that. It really. Well, it was over about two years. Over. Oh, okay. I mean, we must have gone nine months before before we started playing live. So the, the you felt it was he just wanted to rehearse a lot. Uh, uh, he for something to do, or was he overworking the music, or what? I think he wanted to have a really really tight band. He was overworking it, especially the vocal part. Interesting. I, I can tell you from my experience, you know, you know, David, I think, and uh, I'm sure I mentioned it to you, Robin, that um, before I came out to the West Coast, my my main touring things were I did a lot of stuff with Tom Constantin. I was lucky to do a lot of stuff with Vince Welnick when he was around as well. Oh. And um, I can tell you that uh, often he and I would share a hotel room if we had to share our hotel rooms because some of them were on the, you know, not the best of gigs. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Vince, Vince would wake up and say, hey, there's a piano downstairs and let's try and work out these parts, even though, you know, we both pretty much knew what we were doing. But, yeah, there's a little bit of, you know, I think after The Grateful Dead, there was a little bit of uh, uh, an overachieving side to him. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I played a few gigs with him here and there, uh, most notably down in uh, – Arizona, I got invited down, me and him got invited down to play with Extra Ticket on mm. a little, little tour, Flagstaff, Tucson, and Phoenix. Mm. And this was a few years after I had produced the Persuasions record, Might As Well, the Persuasions Sing Grateful Dead. And I had a very warm relationship with the leader of the Persuasions, Jerry Lawson, who lived in the Phoenix area. So he came to this gig in Phoenix and Vince, of course, you know, I was just went nuts for Jerry and vice versa. And we just wound up having this wonderful time. Extra tickets, a terrific dead band. You know, that's the Dave A. Bear was, was uh, their guy, I think at that time. Um, and, but playing with Vince and singing with Jerry was just fabulous. And Lawson had such a good time that he, of, on his own dime and of his own volition, jumped in his car and drove up to Flagstaff to play the next gig with us and then followed us down to Tucson as well. So we wound up playing three gigs together. And I got to do things like sing uh, He Will Break Your Heart with Jerry Lawson, for God's sake. I mean, mm. it was so neat. And Vince had, you know, he just, he had a great pop sensibility and a real sort of showbiz kind of um go for it in this to him that I really liked I edged of course with that depression that never left him. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing, one, one memory uh, that I have of Vince that I think is such an awesome trait is um, just, you know, he, he had the, and Phil does this too. I think they're both so great in this sense. When you do something good, they let you know, you know, they give you that look, that smile. Mm -hmm. And Vince was kind enough to, you know, hang out after the shows and, you know, talk about all the great things that he heard people do, do on stage. And, you know, it's just so encouraging. It's just, it's awesome. Yeah. I feel I should say something nice about him too. We had one, <laughs> one, one wonderful night, um, in a hotel bar that had closed already, playing Roy Orbison songs till dawn. <laughs> yeah, he loved Roy Orbison. I do know he that. did. Yes, yes. I think he might have been able to do something with Roy Orbison at one point, if I'm not mistaken. I, he he, he no could one. hit those notes. Vince could hit those notes. Oh, oh for yes. sure. Notes? He, wow. he did a cover of uh, of Roy Orbison's. Uh, Oh, I can't, I can't think of it, but it, it's, it's that popular song with, you know, that shows off Roy's huge range of vocals. Crying. Crying. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, he did crying. Yeah. 
Yeah, and he did a lot. On the other yeah. hand, he had a habit of inviting all the hotel staff to his room to get stoned. Yes. <laughs> yes indeed. And they find how come there's no waitresses here? <laughs> and it no. was always really good shit in my experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he knew how to have fun. He knew how to be a rock star, which is cool. Yeah. I, I, it's just, I'm, a suicide is uh, unfathomable to me, and it's so heartbreaking that um, yes. how many of our favorite people have succumbed to it. Yeah. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to get you know harp on something too negative, but uh, Vince's suicide really taught me so much about what suicide is and what depression is. Because uh, <clears throat> when I got the call that Vince had killed himself, we had a couple of dates set up for after that. No. So my first reaction was, "Oh shit! Why the fuck did you do this?" Oh. And my second reaction was, "Couldn't you just wait till the next morning? You would have felt fine." Because oh. that's that's how things were with him, you know, and that's. That's basically, I think, how depression works. You know, your mind just gets off kilter, and you know, sometimes just a good night's sleep will fix everything. You know, so you know, yeah, there's lots of things here of things. and really there's got lots it. Things, lots of things about his last moments. You know, he wouldn't let the medics touch him, and they're not allowed to. Fix it. Wow. You tell them not to. Oh. Yeah. On, a, on a happier note, you went on to play music with Rat Dog for a long time. Yes. Let's talk about that. What a fun band that was. Yeah. Yeah, that was incredible. Yes. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Was that your first, like, big, uh, you know, that, that had to be the first, the biggest shows you were playing for your career, right? Oh, yes. You were already big, yes. We weren't trying to build up to being big or anything. Right. It was, yes. That must have felt good to join an ongoing concern that you didn't have to build yourself from the ground up. Yes, it was, and especially as I knew half the tunes already. Not to play, but I knew the tunes. The only thing about it is um, when Wasserman was in the band, he didn't sing, so they already had all the harmony parts worked out, so I didn't get to sing as much as I had in previous situations why why have we not put you to work singing in the times we played together why it didn't even register with me that you were a singer i was reminded when i looked at the missing man record that you sang harmony on that and i went wait a minute why don't we come and sing it's a it's a forgotten skill dude uh, next time we play you're singing jesus okay right. i've had success once or twice of sticking a microphone in front of yeah, Rob. I, I'm so, I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I really liked that time toward the end when you and Wasserman were in the band together. I really liked the way you guys are, you, you used, you know, the roles you guys played, I thought was a really, really nice thing to do. Did you enjoy that? Uh, totally. Thank you for saying that. I think that was one of the most exciting things ever, playing with Wasserman and it working. And it was all just, uh, you know, <laughs> automatic. We knew what to do and what not to do. The la I've seen two other bands that had two bass players. One of them was uh, Ornette Coleman's Double Quartet, which of I course was that. fine. And the other was Willie Nelson and Family. And there I'm pretty sure that they had two bass players so that neither one of them had to work very hard. Hmm. Uh, same with James Brown. He had, had two, <laughs> but it was mostly one at a time. <laughs> But the, but the you guys you say it was automatic. It really felt like that. That, that each of you it, it might have seemed weird to the onlooker to have two bass players, uh -huh. but it really you guys orchestrated it fabulously and really stayed out of each other's way. Yes, and I have no idea how it how it worked, but it hmm. did. <laughs> years years is how it works, I guess. Yes, I guess. Yeah, I of us pretty good years, I think. Well, that brings us to an interesting topic that the three of us are qualified to talk about, and that is the instinctual nature of making music and the getting your ego out of the way nature of making music and the trusting each other nature of making music and all of the the stuff that characterizes the way we like to make music. I'm, I, I'll tell everybody that's watching that I'm a gigantic fan of Robin's playing because he does that thing that is kind of hard to find of being able to hold down the groove magnificently and participate in the musical conversation. And Thank that's, you. that is the sine qua non of jam band bass playing as far as I'm concerned. I'll agree with that, whatever that word means. <laughs> <laughs> 
three words. Well, thank you, David. That definitely has always been my goal, you know, and I don't have to think very much. I've played for so long, I don't have to think very much about what's going on down here with my hands. I can just listen to the music and respond and there's no translation time. So I'm fortunate with that. I, you know, I, don't, I would imagine that your, you know, your your work not only as an engineer but you know producing stuff would put you in that position because isn't improvising kind of like writing a, a a small song on the spot or whatever you know constantly? Yes. Yeah. David Chris yeah. calls it fast composition. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Engineering, I have to say, is amazing because you hear professional players every day, and um, I always thought. Not many of those English bass players were that incredible. Yes. I should I should take that up again, I thought. Well, two of the very best of them came over here. We got you and Pete Sears in the Bay Area. Yeah. Well, thank you. It was wonderful. And another yeah. improviser. Yeah. Mm. So in the timeline of things, you're 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 singing at first. At some point you start playing bass, some point you start engineering, at some point you go back to bass, right? Is there any other instrument in there at all? Well, yes, I was. I played guitar and piano from a very young age. Um, from about, well, there was always a piano in the living room. My father was a good pianist, played only by ear. And pretty much that's how I played too. They tried lessons and the teacher wouldn't teach me because I would just copy what she played and not read the music. <laughs> had a couple of classical guitar lessons because I really wanted to play classical guitar. And the teacher moved after just a few weeks, but she sold me her guitar. So I, I was stuck with a really nice guitar and inspiration to learn classical guitar. And that's why I have rather strange fingering on my bass. People always look at my hands and say, what are you doing? <laughs> um, guitar? Classical guitar fingering on the right hand. Fabulous. Yeah. And that, that's all before the bass. That's all before the bass, yes. And so what point did you decide, you know, I think bass is going to be my main instrument? When I discovered that the, the school stand-up bass had the same tuning as a guitar, but down an octave, I thought, oh, well, that's something I can do. Huh. <laughs> and um, I didn't own a bass till I was about 16 because... Again, as it said in the pre-show video, I was the guitar player in the band and until the bass player started writing tunes and he wanted to play guitar on his own tunes, so switcheroo and that was it. You know, Frank Zappa said that 90% of bass players got the job in a band meeting in high school in a garage when there was three guitar players and one of them had to become a bass player. That's right. It's always nicer to meet bass players who became bass players for more wholesome reasons than, um, you know, was drawing the short straw. Well, I was thinking the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think most most people's stories who are bassists are, you know, bassists because nobody else was playing it or whatever, you know, or they knew how to play it because they played guitar and they needed a bassist. Even Phil, you know, they said we need a bass, but he was a trumpet yeah. player. So <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's a common story. So yeah, it, it is very interesting to hear people who were just. You know, they heard the instrument or saw the instrument and, you know, were inspired to just, you know, make it their instrument. I think that's cool. However, in the 90s, when I was in between everything, really, uh, I got into the golden oldies circuit. You know, the Drifters, the Coasters, Sam and Dave, everybody who was doing the circuit, Mary Wilson, who just died. Um, there's, a, there's a Dale Shannon. There were so many people I couldn't, Peter Noon. You toured I could, acts? I could hardly be, yes, I could hardly begin to name all the people I played with in that period. And at one point, the guitar player left, and they couldn't find a guitar player who could read music. So yeah. I said, well, I can read music, and I can sort of play guitar. So I got that gig for a while, which was Billy Preston. I did, you know, dozens and dozens of gigs playing guitar with Billy. It's wow. amazing. And then you around know. here, you played with the Stoopheads, which is an uh, a yes. endeavor. Talk about that, because some of my favorite musicians were involved with that. Joshua Brody. Yes, well, Josh was head stupid. Yeah. Um, it, well, it was 
Josh's idea of what was stupid, and sometimes it was just because it was repetitive or, you know, stupid words like, uh, some people are made of plastic, kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and, and then he'd have themes, tunes that stopped in the middle, uh, things, like, things like that. <laughs> and um, that was a fun gig. Yeah, it sounds it. <laughs> but the repertoire was all cheesy pop tunes, right? From different. Um, Mostly, yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but all, but the musicianship level is very very high among those people. It's not nobody's um, fucking around here. They know what they're doing with that stuff. Joshua has done some amazing things. I heard a medley of James Bond themes on KPFA one night. That That's turned it. out to be one of Joshua's productions. It was mind blowing. Yes. Hmm. He, also, he also does this thing where he plays just the bridges from Beatles tunes. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny, and I bet very funny. <laughs> Those of you who are watching this who live in the Bay Area, it's hard to find it now, but he's still doing them during COVID. But look for the Beatles thingy that Joshua does where he and at least one other musician will set up in a bar and, and you can go sing a Beatles song with them. I've done it a couple times. It's really fun. It's like a Beatles karaoke run by a really great musician. Beatles thingy. Beatles thingy, yeah. Uh, yes. Beatles That's the thingy. correct terminology. Speaking mm -hmm. of which, for those of you who don't know what a bridge is, <laughs> it's usually uh, the yeah. middle section of a song. That's on, away from the rest of it. <laughs> Music jargon. <laughs> For some reason in England they call it the middle eight. Yeah, yeah well, that's that's common here too. You hear that a lot. It's almost yeah. easier to describe the bridge by naming a few songs that don't have one, like Althea and Franklin's Tower and Fire yeah. on the Mountain. Yeah. None of them have a bridge. Right. The bridge is like right. a musical digression, yeah. and then you go back to the original theme. <laughs> so. Yeah, as you know, I've uh, I've. I do my best at writing songs. And um, when you hear a song like Fire on the Mountain, you say, geez, that's, you know, you can do that song, but you could just, what you could do with two or three chord song and no bridge. <laughs> Why did I work so hard at this song? <laughs> <laughs> is, they, they do get away with that in a lot, a lot, don't they? Oh yeah. <laughs> now, when, when your band was uh, coming up with these songs, Robin, writing music for the first and second album, is you that you that was done as a group? Well, I didn't join until they already had the first album pretty much done. Okay, but um, yes, definitely as a there was a there were two main guys, you know, like John and Paul, who, who were pretty competitive about how many great songs they could write in the quickest time. Uh, but they always wanted some input from. Well, both the drummer and myself. And there are a few tunes that I'm very proud to say I, I actually co-wrote with, with the, the main guy. Cool. Mm. Scott, Scott and I wrote a song together. I, I crave collaboration, but it's really hard to do. And finding people you can collaborate with uh, successfully and comfortably is, is uh, a real find. So we went, we got together one day almost exactly two years ago, and uh, I walked in there with one line of, of uh, words and music, and we walked out of there three hours later with a whole song, and then we went in the studio with you and Greg Anton to record it. Yes, I was going to say, who played bass on that, David? <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> in fact, I know you have played bass on a couple of productions that you forgot about. <laughs> uh, that's actually true. <laughs> they turn up sometimes too on compilation box sets and things. If everybody, we, we should mention it before we move on that the song we're talking about is The Town That Still Believes in Magic, and you can get it on Bandcamp. Go to dgans.bandcamp.com, and it's one of the options there. The Town That Still Believes in Magic, and we recorded a really nice jam in the middle of it too, so it's an extended uh, song. Which, mm. you know, uh, and Rose put the wrong album up on the screen, but it'll get you to the right place. There you go. <laughs> uh, there you go. No, no, that ain't it either. <laughs> Hello, that one's too. No. We, I, think oh. we should, I think we should say what a great job Rose has been doing. It's, it's absolutely. Yes. 
Unbelievable. Yeah, we're all jamming, friends, and having a great time. You can also notice what I'm drinking like. Yeah, that. that's fabulous. Wait, that way. <laughs> there you go. I know, it's confusing. <laughs> well, um, how about your parents? Did they play any instruments? Did that have like an influence on you growing up? Or did they listen to a lot of music? My parents were actors before I was born. And my father kept at it a little bit longer. He played piano very well. He couldn't really read music, but he could write it, which um, is kind of how I was for a while myself. Um, there's a tradition in England called the pantomime, which is mostly at Christmas, really silly sketches, nothing to do with Marcel Marceau. It's not mime, it's pantomime. And, and uh, you normally get a famous comedian playing the lead and the silly songs and my grandfather used to write those and my father would write the music for them wow up to about when i was six or seven i remember him staying up all night to write this score for a pantomime i still have the program for it actually how so, cool that you had a role model of composing in your house i mean that is super yeah. cool. My 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 grandmother was a musician, but my house, you know, they shoved a clarinet in my hands when I was in grade school and stuff. But there wasn't much encouragement of playing or writing. I started writing of my own accord when I was 15 years old, and I haven't stopped since. But it's great that your parents were not just playing but composing. That's very well, cool. My father, my mother was just, you know, she liked to listen to the radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You get along but, well. With, did you get along well with your parents growing up? Yes, very well. Yes, wonderfully. My mother's still with us. Talk to her twice a week. And she's in she's in the U.S. too, right? No, she's in England. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's living in a. Mm, it's not really a care facility, but she does have a red button she can hit if necessary, and she gets things delivered to her door at the yeah. moment. We can't really leave. They're in lockdown, heavy lockdown over yeah. there. Um, but yeah, and as long as uh, my father actually had to, had to get a real job, so he only played for pleasure after a while. He played very well, mostly Broadway musicals. <laughs> yeah, but that that was his passion, huh? That's 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 really great. Yeah. My parents listened to Broadway stuff when I was a kid. I heard, grew up on Kiss Me Kate and oh, yeah. Fair Lady and stuff. My like Fair that. Lady was a big favorite, yes. Yeah. Some of those songs. Loverly. Wouldn't it be lovely? I saw when I was about six or seven, I saw My Fair Lady with Rex Harrison and Julie Andrews. Wow. Yes. On stage? Wow. My, probably my first iconic show that I saw. Wow. I, also, I also saw Jimi Hendrix at the Marquee. I also saw Bob Dylan at the Albert Hall. I had a few, a few iconic shows. Youth. <laughs> I grew up listening to or hearing um, classical music, which is yes. my dad was heavily into classical music. Collected records and always had an incredible stereo system and everything. That you know, as soon as he'd go away, I'd crank up my rock and roll on. <laughs> but at the same time, my mother, who really didn't listen to anything in the house, only listened in the car, uh, would just put like a pop radio station on. So that was my balance of music. I, I you know, I, I was just always so interested in hearing the songs that were coming on the radio as opposed to what my dad was listening to. So I think that, that somehow steered me in the rock and roll direction eventually. Uh -huh. My my, uh, my older brother, two years older than me, went back east in the summer of 1961 when he was nine and I was seven. And when he came back, he visited with our, our older cousin there. When he came back, he got into the radio. We started listening to Top 40 radio. Mm -hmm. They they made rock and rollers out of us, but it was just before the Beatles. It was when there was stuff like the Four Freshmen and Patty Page and the Dovells and Chubby Checker, you know, it was all mixed up together on the radio in those days. Yeah, yeah. It was, it uh, was a different kind of, a, a very, a lot of different kinds of music came into to my head that way because my brother uh, yes. <laughs> went to New York. Likewise. I um, well, I started when I, I had a little uh, 
cl clock radio in my uh, bedroom. And the, one of the only stations that I could get in was an AM station, WNBC, with Imus in the morning. And back in that day, when I was a kid, it was literally everything. You'd hear, you know, Beatles and you know, just, you know, more poppy stuff. I mean, it literally was just everything. Disco, you know, so mm -hmm. just whatever was popular. And AM well, radio, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine now, you know, there's just like no music on AM radio. So I, know. I made myself a little crystal set from a kit. Uh -huh. I listened to him after bedtime on a single sided headphone. Uh, which was great, but there wasn't much good music on the BD in those days. Was it was pirate radio happening at that time? Uh, not really. But, well, it, it happened later, huh? A little bit later than that. Mm. When I was I was already a teenager before that started up. You that built this radio? Was that? Is that what you said? You built this radio? No, I asked if pirate radio was happening. Oh, it's I know. I thought Robin said that he put together yes. a crystal. Well, it's a crystal set. It has like four parts. <laughs> huh. And, uh, oh, yeah, I remember those. I, I built one that didn't work. <laughs> oh, yes. But I did one thing that I, every Friday night when I'm around, um, there's a local on a very small local station that, um, called Duke and Bonner, and they play that exact mix of tunes that David just described, all the oldies and some corny, some amazing doo-wop and, and beyond. Yeah. So it's three hours of, of you know, they, they specialized in playing records that weren't hits. So it's really a fun show to listen to. Yeah, that yeah. sounds interesting. The opposite of what I was listening to. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> well, I had classical when I was a kid. Yeah, my parents listened to opera and stuff like that when I was little. Actually, some of the first music that I really, really got into was classical music. There was a record called The Moldau, this orchestral piece that was all about a river, right? And it was the kind of thing like, um, it just sort of gave me the idea of music as a metaphor. And I really liked playing in the orchestra and playing like a Bach fugue and things like that that I played in the orchestra. I like being exposed to all the different kinds of music to, to listen to and even to play a little bit, you know, and I think it really helped uh, me develop a, a wider range, you know, as a as a composer myself, being more open to different kind of ideas. And the more you hear, I think, the wider your uh, ears become, the, the better you'll be at comprehending what you need to do in real time, right? right. One of my main relaxing things is still playing piano. I, I work through Bach. You see, see how good it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went so, in the studio apartment and had a, an upright piano. I could literally sit on the couch and put my feet up on the on the piano, which was on the opposite wall. It was this tiny little apartment. And I didn't didn't even fucking play the piano, but I had somebody gave it to me, so I had it for years. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> inert piece of furniture. <laughs> yeah. uh, How weird. So both you guys obviously, you know, kind of influenced by something other than rock and roll before you discovered rock and roll. And yes. I, you know, I think in, in in Robin's case, it included jazz and classical. David, you just talked about classical being an influence on you. And I think what I hear as, as a younger person, what I hear a lot from older people who, you know, were around before rock and roll was really popular and then became popular is I'm that. Not, not old. <laughs> not old. <laughs> old older. <laughs> um, that, you know, people had this sort of attitude that, you know, and especially because of the beginnings of rock and roll, I understand where this came from that, you know, I'm going to go into rock and roll because it's a good way to make money compared to this jazz stuff I'm doing, or um, it's more fun. It's, it, it does, it's not as serious. And I think there was that general attitude that like, you know, okay, I grew up learning this, this rigid format of music. And, you know, now here's something that's uh that's maybe like lower brow or, you know, um, less artistic in a way, but I'm going to embrace it for the fun of it. And 
Do you, you guys feel that way? Because I, I personally, from where I'm coming from, I, I view rock and roll just as smart, uh, just as much as an art as classical or jazz might be. Of course it is. I, speaking yeah. for myself, I'll, quickly, Robin, before I hand it over to you, uh, I, I played music as a kid as part of my cultural enrichment, and I grew up in the L.A. city schools and stuff, but it didn't become a calling until I wrote a song. Yeah. And I, and when I was 15 and my older brother had a guitar and he showed he put, put some chords to some of my teenage poetry and taught it to me and I was off and running and then it became a calling. It never before that, it, it wasn't, I had no thoughts about music except as something that I did, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it never occurred to me that it would be my life until that moment and then I thought of nothing else. Right. I also never felt like, I because the first things I ever did were my own songs. I think I always was following that path and gathering the other stuff along the way, rather than entering a world of music that had any definitions. Right? I I made it up as I went along and learned it as I went along, because I was driven to by writing songs. Anyway, over to you, Robin. Well, I was just going to say with the scarcity of gigs these days. When when I actually get to play with other people, it's it, it's I feel like, oh, I'm not going insane after all. Keeping insane. <laughs> Scott and I just did one recently. That was uh, didn't that feel good, Scott? Oh, so good. <laughs> that day so high high. Yeah, but um, I don't know. It's it's very important to me, and it's been missing, and sadly missing. Well, I, I, I play solo every day here at home, and I miss playing with other musicians. That's it. Scott, Scott and I played on my front lawn a couple times last year, and it's getting close to the time when we can start thinking about doing that again. Yeah. But just Playing a gig in a, in a room seems pretty far off for me. I hope you guys were doing it outdoors. Yes. yes. So I haven't done anything indoors since this whole crazy thing started. No. A few, well, a few I things I've done have been outdoors. I did a Sweetwater get out the vote thing with Mark Karen. But it was oh, empty, yeah. empty sweet water. That was spooky too. Right. I remember seeing Nobody something. There. Nobody in the kitchen. <laughs> it's been really interesting watching people learn how to do this. And I feel like because I've been in radio for 35 years, I kind of have a leg up on some of my musician friends because I'm used to talking to imaginary audiences already. <laughs> right? Like, so playing music to an imagined audience is less of a stretch for me because i'm i already talked to these people yeah uh, but i miss playing in a room with people god damn it i know i do too but there there's still there's still is something like uh magical about doing these live streams i i know you know i i feel like there's there's you know i feel some sort of connection between whoever's watching even if they're not chatting you know I feel some sort of connection between whoever may be watching. You know, oh, yeah. I, I'm not saying it, that, that it, it doesn't offer any of that. It does for me. I mean, obviously and hugely, I've got a group of people that come every day and we have a, we talk in email all freaking day long and stuff. A real community has sprung up around my daily feed. And although I don't interact with them during the show, I interact with them before and after, and they're very much a part of the show. It feels great to me to be doing it, and, and uh, utterly apart from the fact that I desperately miss playing with other people. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. I get it. Robin, yes. what do you think you would do <laughs> if you weren't a bassist? What would you be doing? <laughs> If you weren't a musician, music was off the chart, what would you be doing? I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually. What, what about you, Scott? Well, you know, I'd probably go back to engineering, but I'm really an analog engineer. Yeah. <laughs> eight. yeah. Uh, I sort of like playing music in a way anyway, as you said. I really don't know. Uh, yeah. people, some people encourage me to write. They say, you write really well. You should write something. And, uh, I asked you that because, uh, and to answer your question, David, that I've been asked that before, and I also have no answer. It's like I have no idea. You know, the pressure is so great. But one one thing that I came up with that I thought might be a suitable 
uh, substitute for what I do. For some reason, I could never play music, not be in the music industry at all. Maybe a truck driver. I just, I, I love the traveling aspect of music. I love to see, you know, other portions of the country, uh, you know, and I love to be with friends and just, you know, traveling, you're doing nothing. You have no responsibility. So, yeah, I love to shoot the shit and do this kind of stuff. So I think that's what I would do. And I'd have to bring a couple of friends with me in my truck. That would be fun. I, I, I have a very uh, boring answer to that. I did some work as a graphic designer when I was a kid. My parents were both graphic artists, and so I learned how to do paste up and stuff. So I did some of that, and I was a proofreader and shit like that when I was younger. So I probably would have wandered into that world and maybe become a magazine journalist anyway. But I, I, I did all those things on, on the way uh, to being a musician because they enriched my musical life. But I haven't had to choose. I've gotten to earn my living doing music-related things for 40-plus years now. Well, but David, you are an author, and you are a DJ. You're covered. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You do a lot of things really well. Why, well, thank you. Hey, we should mention, uh, do we have any, any gigs coming up or anything? We're running out of time here. we got three and a half minutes left, basically. Whoa, this went fast, huh? It sure did. Um, I, I should mention the box set that I just received. Yeah, please do. Tell us all about it. Um, it's um, my. There was a band in my high school um, that I took into my studio on a Sunday afternoon, recorded some demos. And um, we got them a deal with a and Records and Warner's in the States uh, to do, well, series of albums. We only got up to two albums, um, which we made in Trident Studios, which was a wonderful experience, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Roy Thomas Baker was still the engineer at that point. Um, and um, Cherry Red Records has assembled a five CD set, including my high school band as the first CD because we had a record on a cheapo label. Um, the two professional CDs, and then one that I produced entirely from live tapes and another demo session, and then a last CD just of live tapes. But anyway, five CDs. It, the band is called Byzantium, and um, it's just come out on Cherry Red Records. I can't tell you much more than that. <laughs> I want to hear this, Rob. Rob, I got to hear this. That sounds like a lot of fun. Cherry mm -hmm. Red Records? Yes. It's available on yeah. Amazon. Uh, Amazon? Cool. I yes, guess. Amazon US. Rose has a copy oh, of it. Hey, there it is. Yes. Hey, everybody. Okay. That's Rose. She runs this show here. Thank you, Rose. This has been really, really fun. Thank you, Rose. Great thing. And thank you, Robin. Oh, well, thank you. It's been yeah, really right. fun. Can't hear you, Rose. We can't hear you, Rose. <laughs> Reading your lips. Can you hear me? My mic was off. I'm sorry. <laughs> tech hey. person who needs help with tech. <laughs> thank you, Robin. Thank you, guys, all of you. This has been so awesome and fun. Um, I really appreciate it. And everybody who's out there in TV land or whatever land we call this <laughs> in this era, streaming land. All right, I'm getting out because I'm not part of it. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Rose. Thanks for holding up the record, though. Yes. That's thanks. great. I, so that's – is that your you, – are you on other records? Or are there other – did you play any of those Rory Gallagher records? No, unfortunately. We spent a lot of time together, just the two of us, you know, doing overdubs and mixing and things, and we jammed. Um, room, he told me once – um, you'll never know how close you got to being asked to play keyboards with us. <laughs> and I said, oh, but coming from Rory, it might have been partly an exaggeration. But, Would you have uh, done it? We did. Well, we did. We jammed quite a lot, guitar and piano. And then sometimes I'd play his guitar, his iconic guitar, and um, and he'd fool around. And, I don't so know. You, would, you would have happily mm. taken the job as a keyboardist for him, huh? Yeah, well, I nearly joined Wishbone Ash's keyboard player at one point. I remember I you saying that. That's amazing. My side career as keyboard player, but I would have had to, well, you know, do some woodshedding to really. <laughs> 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 well, Rory's stuff I could have done. That's just the blues, really. All right. Yeah. 
Well, it's been great having you, Robin. And uh, Scott, Thank you. I think we got something here that might have some potential. Yes, I agree with you, David. This is fun. Yeah. I hope everyone Thank else. you all for joining us here on Stream Stock, and I suspect we'll be announcing another one of these fairly soon, as soon as we can line up another victim. By the yes. way, all the, three, all the three of us need is a drummer, you know. That's correct. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> we, Let's work on that. <laughs> I can't wait till the next time the three of us are able to play together with any drummer we can think of. It's I really miss playing with both of you. Uh, me yeah. too. I, Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, all. Bye. How does this end, Rose? There's an after show thing, isn't there? Oh, yeah. She puts on a thing, right? Yeah. We just have to stare at the screen until it goes. <laughs> all right. <laughs>